I'm here with hardcore icon, hardcore legend, Tommy Dreamer. Tommy, how are you today? Good morning. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, you, uh, you've obviously been very busy. You got uh, House of Hardcore, which has been doing tremendous. Now fans can watch it live on Twitch. Uh, and and you also got a um, a wrestling seminar next week. Next week, next Wednesday. Um, how has it been lately? Just uh, just super busy. Uh, beyond busy for my first show with Twitch. I uh, I pulled twenty hour day, two twenty hour days, a nineteen hour day, and an eighteen hour day that was going into the uh, show, and then uh, that Friday night. After we wrestled uh, the first show, we drove to Long Island, from Long Island to Philadelphia, got in around 4 o'clock in the morning, and then uh, had to be up for 9, and then we had the House of Hardcore show uh, that day, so I think I probably went to bed around, around 4 and then had an appearance. So I was putting in uh, insane hours, but you know, it's at the end of the day, it's been uh, all worth it. Uh, and and what has surprised you uh, regarding uh, running House of Hardcore? Uh, oof, a lot of things. <laughs> uh, production costs is one that are insane. Um, as I always kind of say, as a wrestler, I love uh, going through tables or using a ladder. And uh, as a promoter, when someone breaks a table, I'll say that just cost me like two hundred dollars. <laughs> so that's uh, kind of the the big difference. Yeah. Well, uh, it it does seem like independent wrestling. Um, I don't know if it's a resurgence. Like it, it's kind of been around, but it just definitely does seem hotter than ever, especially with the internet uh, services like Twitch making it more accessible. Uh, what what changes have you seen like over the past decade as far as independent wrestling? <laughs> I do feel it's improved. Um, I also think with, you know, social media, social media has changed the face of, you know, television. It's definitely changed the face of pro wrestling. And, uh, you know, more people are able to promote their shows. Uh, most of my shows are all social media driven. And, um, you know, word of mouth of, hey, you know, if you're going to see quality wrestling. And uh, that's kind of how, it's no longer about, oh, I got to get, you know, on television. Now it's just, you know, you have to get a distributor. Yeah. And and, and with the hardcore um, style, um, obviously wrestling is a lot safer now. You, you're not in WWE, no longer see chair shots to the head. Uh, are there certain rules that you guys have as well um, regarding wrestler safety? Uh, that I'm sure it's, I mean, it's it's a whole different ballgame from ECW's heyday, but... Uh, yes. But what are your thoughts uh, these days regarding, you know, concussions and wrestler safety and things like that? Absolutely. You know, the the game, every sport has uh, progressed. And so as, a, you know, professional wrestling, there will never be a chair shot to the head in, in my company either. It uh, It's as efficient and hurts just as much to your uh, back. And, uh, you know, they have, when we were doing an ECW, you know, it was all, we didn't know the long-term effect or, or the issues that concussions could cause uh, for me also too. Uh, and, you know, I used the term, my company was House of Hardcore just because based upon my connection with, you know, the original ECW and, you know, ECW's original House of Hardcore school. But um, for me, it's, you know, the word hardcore is more a pat, about passion and work, at, work, ugh, work ethic mm -hmm. with how guys, you know, pretty much, and girls lay it all out on the line. And, you know, also like with rules, with blood, uh, I don't stop because of blood. But, you know, for me, there's really not a lot of blood. And when I had, uh, I just lost uh, first blood match to Joey Mercury, but I was, you know, AIDS and hepatitis tested stuff we never did in the original ECW. Yeah, um, and with that, uh, how many how many concussions do you think you've you've had? Um, what's deemed a concussion? Uh, <laughs> I think I should probably be legally dead. Um, I remember probably had 
three going into being a pro wrestler, uh, just being, you know, a kid. I got knocked out once playing Frisbee and I ran right into a tree. Like I got it. I got it. And ran face first into a tree and just knocked out. No time I got uh, thrown off a horse, landed on my head. Uh, that was a bad one. And I was probably about like eight. Yeah. Um, and probably another time playing sports as a kid. So that was probably three in my training. Uh, yeah. In my training, probably twice. So that would be five. Uh, I remember in ECW, I once got three in a week. I remember getting one on a Saturday night and then getting one on a Friday and then another one on a Saturday. Um, dude, I probably, if it's a, a rough estimate, 16 to 17. What, I mean, I'm sure there's always different reasons or ways to get a concussion, but was it usually chair shots to the head or, or what usually uh, caused it? Or was it just a bunch of different things? My Actually, I mean, my first one in training in wrestling, Taz gave me the be a belly to belly, and we were trained in a boxing ring, and I took the bump wrong, and I hit my head on the mat, and just you know, that's a lot of one. It's a boxing ring, so there was less give. It was dead posted. Um, you know, it could be as simple as something like that. Uh, and I remember just like spinning and then going in the back and throwing up. Uh, but again, that was 1989 and, you know, I, I just threw up and my trainer at least didn't say get back in the ring. Uh, he was just like, all right, just, you know, go home. Uh, ECW, you know, it's funny. Uh, <laughs> the first, my first concussion was, uh, from an Indigiri right to the back of the head, uh, from Jason, the sexiest man on earth. He gave me my first, uh, one in ECW. I remember Mikey Whipwreck uh, at one time DDT'd him on a on a Nintendo, and he got a concussion. Um, Rob Van Dam kicking a chair into my head once uh, gave me one. I remember like everything, like I could see everything going black, and then I was like, no, 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 and then uh, it was like everything sped up really, really quick, and then. Uh, I was, you know, I kind of got out of it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think I only had probably two tops in my entire WWE career. Uh, one was from a Bob Holly slap, and I was completely unconscious for the entire match. And then uh, I woke up uh, with Bob Holly hitting me with his Alabama uh, slam. Jeez. So, uh, no, I don't, you know, there haven't been really enough studies yes they said blows to the head mm -hmm. here's my whole it's a hot uh button topic yes they're doing more and more research but they don't have as much research as you know they can if you look at a if you look at a, an injury let's say a cut i have a cut on my hand uh it's bleeding i have to stop the bleeding and then you know if it forms a scab i know it's healing with your brain, there's no way to actually, hey, you know, you got a brute, you know, your brain hit your skull, and there's no way to see your brain is bleeding. There's, you know, there's a lot of, there's no scab. It's really how you, how you feel. I've noticed for a lot of people that the older you're getting, the harder it is to uh, kick out of a concussion or the longer effects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me to keep on going or like without having, you know, as opposed to other people who've had concussions and had to retire or, or, or couldn't do it anymore, you know, mm. like a, let's say a Daniel Bryan or I don't know if you other people, Chris Nowinski, you know, Chris Nowinski was early in his career, but he said most of his concussions happened with in football and, you know, then it happened in wrestling and then it was just, you know, lights out one. But, you know, the more the more research you can do, the better it is. I do look at it and how come, I, I guess I would compare it to cancer. How come some people get cancer and some people don't? Right. Uh, in the sense of you look at some boxers, you look at some boxers and you talk to them, or you listen to how they talk earlier in their interviews, 
in their career and you see them now and you're like, ooh, and then you look at like someone like a Sugar Ray Leonard or other boxers that have no speech problems or even football players. You know, you have you have some players that are really messed up and then you have other players that are fine. So it's just, it's a weird, weird study. Uh, but I guess, and I'm happy that, you know, WWE has gone out of their way for it, just like the NFL, just like uh, hockey. Everyone's, you know, making more because they're, they're making their athletes better. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I would never just say chair shots because, I mean, there's times where guys have hit me with a chair shot and it was as light as getting hit with by a punch, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Right. There's, there's an art to swinging a chair. Uh, in ECW, was different. We would swing it and try to break it on other guys' heads. That's, uh, you know, that right. <laughs> was insane. But we were insane. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, are you surprised at, at how fondly people still remember ECW? Just because it, you would just think that the age of wrestling fans today would be, you know, just very different uh, with the with the younger group. Uh, well, I mean, WWE Network has helped that. Yeah. YouTube has helped that even on my own shows, uh, you know, or my show Saturday, the moment I go out there, you know, you'll hear ECW chants. If you put two ECW wrestlers, uh, in a room together somewhere, an ECW chant will break out. It's awesome. It's my legacy. It's something I'm very, very proud of. I want to say probably also because everyone heard the stories and, you know, the myths, the legends. And then when you watch them, like, wow, these are all true. And, you know, WWE glorified a lot of the, the violence and the moves. What we did, and it was a lot with what Paul Heyman did, we did things that were so special and so unique. I just, uh, it's funny, I was watching, I watch wrestling when I'm doing cardio in the morning, and I was watching the Monday Night Raw where Braun Strowman uh, came, uh, drove Kane through the ring, Mm-hmm. And Beulah walked by, who does not watch professional wrestling at all, and she said, they're still copying ECW? Because we were the first <laughs> right. to ever do stuff like that. You know, and you think about, we, the big difference between back then and now, especially what we always did in ECW, we made everything special. Uh, you know, Big Show got thrown through a cage, and it was, oh, it's Monday Night Raw. Hey, we might show what happened to Big Show, or we may not even talk about it again. Right. But, you know, Taz going through the ring with Bam Bam Bigelow, I was there for it, and it was it was shocking. And we we did shocking stuff, and we did memorable stuff, and we always reminded you. You know, people still tell me today, oh, you're the guy who kicked out of Jimmy Snooker's, first person to kick out of Jimmy Superfly Snooker's Splash. Or I remember when you got caned, or I remember when you got Chuck slammed from the top of the ECW building, you know? <laughs> And uh, because we showed it all the time and reminded people why it was special. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, with ECW, I, I remember for a while you'd, you'd, you'd hear money problems, but it always seemed like ECW was going to be around, you know, in the late 90s. Um, when did you start seeing uh, that it probably wasn't going to be able to survive? Uh, I did think it was going to survive. There was opportunities for it to survive. The biggest thing is none of us knew that Paul was in Vince's pocket the whole time. So yeah. it couldn't have survived because of that. Yeah. And when, when WWE purchased the assets and, and they were bringing it back, um, did you think it was going to be different the way they were going to bring it back? Or did you kind of envision how it would end up, end up being? Uh, I I wrote the first one night stand and Vince McMahon said I want this to be different. I actually had a fight for Paulie to be on the show because at that time they hated Paulie, mm-hmm. and it was different and it was very very close to the original ECW. And then when the second one was coming around, we were going. It was supposed to be different. I probably had about two months of perfect nirvana bliss because I was like, I did it. And they were, you know, you're in charge. It's going to be different. And, uh, then as I saw 2006, one night stand was being laid out on the table and certain things were changing. And I was just, uh, I could see the writing on the wall that it was different. So kind of right then and there. And I, 
I had an opportunity uh, to do something, but I just knew it was going to be another WWE product. So I just kind of stepped down and I, I didn't, you know, I was on the writing team now with it. And it just, it wasn't what the first one was. It was still decent. But uh, then I knew, I knew what it would just become. And it was that by the first show. Yeah. And I kind of just walked away and I actually stopped being in those creative meetings. Yeah. What about uh, when TNA with the Hard Justice pay-per-view, was that pretty much all you? Uh, Hardcore Justice, yeah. I wrote that whole show too, uh, which was awesome. Dixie and uh, Vince Russo at the time. I just had left WWE and uh, they were just kind of garnering for anything really cool. And they said, hey, uh, you want to write this? Uh, Take care of it. And I was in total control. It was uh, one of the most profitable pay-per-views. I believe it was the most profitable mm-hmm. pay-per-view in TNA history, which was cool for me too. But then the lovely politics flew in like I never saw before and only heard about through WCW. And I was just like, see you later. Yeah. There and was... now I have my own company, which is no politics, no BS, just wrestling. A lot of... A lot of uh, Everything that happened to me has kind of come to fruition through my own company, and I'm very, very happy about that. And, you know, you're also talking about the difference of, you know, now and then uh, wrestling-wise, not being with WWE, I will this year do 182 wrestling shows, which at 46 years old is the most I've ever done. Last year, I want to say it was like 120, but... 146 is a lot, and I get reminded that, you know, hey, you quit WWE, to, you were unhappy, and you took a lesser schedule to be with the kids, and you're wrestling more now than ever, <laughs> and it's, I was like, yes, well, my kids have to go to college, and, you know, they both need braces, so, uh, but, yeah, man, it's, wrestling's on fire, it's also because people want to see something different, that's really, uh, I equate right now in the industry the more the more social media and the more you can watch wrestling people just want more yeah. people asking what's the difference between house of hardcore and wwe my answer is nothing it's still professional wrestling wwe would be the new england patriots they would or dallas cowboys or the new york yankees it's wrestling. Uh, I would like to be the New York Mets or the Jacksonville Jaguars or the Minnesota Vikings, if this is Minnesota-based. They are different organizations still playing the game, uh, the same game with different players and a different management style. So that's really, you know, and some teams will win and some teams will lose. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And this Saturday, it's Waukesha? Is that hey, Waukesha, Wisconsin? Waukesha. Waukesha. Okay. And that's uh, Austin Aries' hometown, correct? And he'll be on the card? It's Austin Aries' hometown. First time he's ever wrestling in his hometown. It's also where they uh, did the making, the Netflix making of a killer documentary. Oh, that. yeah. oh, that's what they also were famous for. It's an awesome venue, awesome place. It's going to be packed. We have a huge pre sale, which I'm so happy about because these. Last two shows, I went all out financially. Before, when you asked me the other thing, uh, too, it's just when I worked for ECW, when I worked for WWE, when I worked for TNA, it was always everybody else's money. Now this is my money. And, uh, you know, you have to do budgets. You have to do so much stuff. And, again, like I said, everything has a price tag. Uh, But these two shows are so loaded. Uh, It's Candice Michelle's last ever match, which I'm very, very happy to give to her. I've noticed women have an easier time leaving the industry than men do. Mm-hmm. and But I also feel I'm a very, very strong proponent, proponent on giving people their last match in the sense of it's really going to be your last match. I, As a promoter, I use it as a marketing tool, but also then as I stick, I think what also always made me different is I stick to stipulations mm-hmm. and that, you know, hardcore justice, I use that in the sense of this is the last time you're ever going to see Tommy Dreamer versus Raven. And I 
independent promoters asked me, like, would you wrestle Raven one-on-one? I was like, no. And they offered me a lot of money to do it. And I was like, no, I stuck, I have to stick to my word. Yeah. And even though it was, you know, with TNA, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Uh, even when I left WWE, I knew ECW was, uh, kind of on the rocks. And I just said, Hey, I will never wrestle in ECW again. If I lose to Zack Ryder and, never wrestle in ECW again. Uh, so for yeah. me, I've used me and Terry Funk tagging for the very last time. And that was beyond emotional and beyond an awesome event. I used the last time, Hey, you're ever going to see Tommy Dream and Beulah walk down the ring. I did last ever appearance with Tracy Brooks. And now, uh, a last ever, last ever, uh, wrestling match by Candice Michelle. And she hasn't wrestled in since she's left the WWE. Yes. She's been training her butt off, and she's so excited. And the real reason why I did it, and the same when I when I did it to Beulah, she got so nervous, and she was like, what if fans don't remember? And Tracy Brooks said the same thing. And I said, wrestling fans remember everything. Yeah. And I remember seeing both of these people who were so far removed from wrestling and happy that they have kids bawling their eyes out again in, in the wrestling ring. Yeah. And it's not only does the wrestler need closure, but so do the wrestling fans. And, you know, uh, I love that the wrestling fans should be able to say goodbye to Candace Michelle and say, thank you for all your, you've done and think of great memories that you've uh, given us. And they should do that for everybody. Ric Flair had a great send off. You know, you watched the 30 for 30, but then he came back. And even though, you know, they said he did it for the money and all that stuff, it's, it's funny but you do lose credibility as much as the fans like to see that, uh, that you do come back. But to me, you lose credibility with the fans. And for me, when I say I'm never going to wrestle again, I will never wrestle again. I don't want that day to come, but I also have something called pride. And one day when I say, Hey, I'm never going to wrestle again. And you know, we're going to have my last match. I'll probably, probably do a tour before our last match. But yeah. I want to see where I'd want to do my last match. Yeah. Wow. I, I did want to ask you about that as well with Candice. Uh, was that a, a deal where she contacted you and was like, hey, I kind of want to get back in the ring one last time? Or or how did the idea nope. come about? Uh, me and her have been friends for years. Mm-hmm. And I knew I had this event and I knew it was in her hometown. You know, she's from uh, Milwaukee area, which is, you know, pretty much right outside of Waukesha. And She's a Wisconsin girl. And I said, hey, I'm doing a show. I want to know if you are interested in having one more match. You tell me what you want to do, and I will do it. If you want to do a mixed tag, me and you, uh, versus somebody, and I said, you pick your opponent. You pick whatever you want to do, or if you want to do uh, singles. You know, originally I was going to do, uh, I said, I put on the table her and... Carlito versus me and uh, I'm sorry, me and her versus Carlito and Victoria or Victoria and Stevie Richards. And I said, I'll get whoever you want. And she was just like, you know, she was actually in tears. And she said, well, I can't believe you're thinking of me. And I said, well, I'm thinking of you because I want to put butts in seats, but I also want to do that for you. And uh, she, um, She picked, I want to do one last singles with Victoria, and she's been training her butt off. And uh, that's awesome. And she's gotten herself in amazing shape where, you know, because I've seen pictures of her, and, you know, she's a mother of three that hasn't wrestled in for years, and she'll send pictures of me with the bruises, and she's like, why are you you doing this to me, (laughs) you know? (laughs) And then uh, I was like, I'm not doing anything for you. You didn't have to do anything. And then she was just like... uh, no, you know, I'm, 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 she, she's taking it very, very seriously, which I love. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask you, uh, so you got Austin Aries wrestling, who I, I think a, a lot of people say very underrated, Joy Mercury. Um, you, you're facing Abyss. Uh, Al Snow will be there, Horns, uh, Swoggle, uh, the, Spirits, the former Spirit Squad, the squad, MVP, Carlito. So it's a stacked show. Um and people can watch it live on Twitch. Uh, so your first event on Twitch was two weeks ago, correct? Yes. And um, 
I want to ask you also about Austin Aries, you know, back on the independent scene, uh, the shows he did for you were, were his first. I, th- I thought he did a, a great promo at, uh, at the house, of, the last house, of hardcore event. Some of the fans, uh, <laughs> were heckling him a bit. Uh, how, how has Aries been to, to work with and, and since leaving WWE? I mean, I mean, I've known him for a long, long time. We actually talk a lot outside of wrestling and not really just about wrestling. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, a lot of guys, when this is coming up on House of Hardcore, 36, 39 talents have signed with WWE that I used. Uh, some have come back. He's one of them. Um, we were, a lot of times, once guys leave, you don't really hear from them. He would you know, talk to me every once in a while, just, you know, hey, man, I'm in the car. I've got a long drive. You know, I know you're up. Just talking and really, you know, not even talking professional wrestling. Uh, we're friends. I think Austin Aries is very misunderstood. He addressed a lot of those issues on Chris Jericho's podcast. And he also, when I say it's no politics, no BS, just wrestling, he was nervous. And I was like, dude, just go out there and talk. And we were going back and forth. Uh, and I was like, you don't have to tell me your promo. Uh, just, I handed him a lighted microphone and I promoted it as that. I said, you were announcer on Raw. You have stuff to say, get it off your chest. I do feel his promo was, was too long, but yes, what happened to him, some people started heckling him and it threw him off. Mm-hmm. But then he delivered his promo and it wasn't, it was a very good promo. And it wasn't, I shouldn't even say promo. He was just talking and that was from his heart. And he was, when you leave WWE, man, there's, there's a bit of an uncertainty going on. And I just said, Hey man, if you're mad, tell us if you're sad, tell us, go out there and talk to the people. And you know, He's listened back to it too, and he stands by his word. I don't think some of the people wanted to hear it in the sense of, you know, but it it really, yes, you are correct. His message is correct, and that's all he really wants to do. And, you know, I'm happy I'm able to let him wrestle in his home set. Uh, He's just getting back from Australia after... He did my first two shows, or his first shows out of WWE, and then he went to Australia. I don't know, and he doesn't know if he wants to be wrestling uh, full time anymore. He's doing a lot of good stuff. He wants to really just help people, and you know, how do you, how do you knock someone who wants to help people? So yeah, he can't. And that was all about his his promo of you know he wants he's a different person when he first started out, and this is when I tell you full circle, it's it's great full circle and you know uh i'm happy to do it for him yeah i wanted to ask you too did you did you happen to watch raw last night uh parts okay because it looks like they're finally gonna have matt hardy uh kind of bring back his his broken character um which i believe the last time he used it was for you guys at uh house of hardcore in in april yes um what are your thoughts on that you think uh you think that could work in wwe Absolutely. Uh, if you think about one year ago, Matt Hardy was probably the hottest wrestler out there. He was probably the last uh, good thing to watch on TNA. And I'm not saying that as a slight to TNA, but right. he was unique. He was different. He was a character. And, you know, how he tweeted, how he did everything was in full deletion mode. And,. I never, I used Matt all the time. It was, we had a, we had a unwritten contract of, Hey, I have shows you're booked on them unless someone's going to pay you more money. And, you know, Matt was just like me killing it all over wrestling every weekend on the Indies, but he was the hottest, hottest character. And if they give him that freedom and let him be him with that, he'll become one of the hottest stars they have again because when Matt and Jeff came back, it was awesome. I love Matt and Jeff. And then, you know, you can't look at them, how WWE is viewing them as uh, a retro act. And yes, they were, were hot and 
their ladder match was awesome. You can't, oh, they're here to get the younger guys over. They still have a lot of gas left in the tank as performers. Unfortunately, Jeff got hurt. And now Matt, if he hits this character in stride, it will, I mean, even if you saw when he did the, the first little delete, then everyone picked up on it. And just like I said earlier, wrestling fans don't ever forget. And Matt was so super duper hot. And I could just see WWE profiting from merchandise and delete signs and you name it. They give him the ball and Matt will deliver it. Yeah, it seems like they would have to let him kind of uh, be in charge. Like, I, I, I just can't see someone else scripting it. You know what I mean? Like, it, it seems right. like that would have to be from him. Um, so obviously you got a huge weekend house of hardcore the last one of the year, right? Until, uh, late January. Yep. And then also next week, a week from Wednesday, you're doing a training seminar at the Academy school of professional wrestling, uh, in Minnesota. That's the school run by Mr. Anderson and Sean Dabari. Uh, what can people expect from that? Yeah, man, you know, it's funny. I, I hired both guys into WWE both super duper talented <clears throat> and I'm also for looking for talent for my own company and they have two groups. There's one where people who have no experience to 20 matches and then uh, that's the first session. And then the second session is if you're more experienced wrestler and you, you know, trying to get a look at for me, I just, my seminars are, I don't care how many times you can run the ropes. I don't care of, uh, I'm very, very honest with people and we'll try to help them take their careers to the next level. That's how I've always been and try to improve them. I will equate it to, if you think about Clayton Kershaw is the best pitcher in baseball. Uh, he's got the most Cy Youngs. Uh, he's the highest paid player, uh, baseball player pitcher for a talent and a skill that is very very hard to do um he goes out there every five six nights but guess what he's the best at what he does and he doesn't throw a perfect game every day he doesn't throw a no hitter every day he has a catcher he has a bullpen coach he has a pitching coach he has a manager he has a bench coach and he, he has other pitchers. He has five people who are higher than him tell, how, trying to help him, and he's the best at what he does. I'm trying. I used to come through that curtain, and I would have Paul Heyman, Terry Funk, Mick Foley, uh, Shane Douglas helping me. And I'm just trying to give people helpful advice. You don't, you don't get that a lot in wrestling or nowadays. You get it. I see it all the time, especially on indies guys or girls are asking their friends how they, how was their match? And they're like, Oh, great. And those people on your same level with you, you always want to, to me, I was always a sponge and you always want to try to get better. Even before ECW, I had guy, you know, Tony Atlas always helping me because I would always wrestle them and always ask them, Oh, did I do anything wrong to, you know, what could I have done better? But you know, nowadays, if you're in the minor leagues, you, if you're happy with being in the minor leagues, cool. I tell people that all the time. It's it's awesome being an independent wrestler. But if you want to make it to where you can make more money, let's say Ring of Honor, New Japan, House of Hardcore, WWE, um, then you need to improve on this, whether it's your body, whether it's your what you do in the ring. Uh, so you need those coaches, and that's kind of what I try to apply. Ken and, and Davari, they teach you the basics and then they, you know, will try to help you the best that they can further your career. So, you know, and then bringing in outside people like myself, and I know they've done a few other seminars with different people, they're going to tell you their experiences and what can help them. And as you know, life is a lot about connections because it could be like, hey, man, this is really, um, you know, I may do a show in Minnesota in 2018. And if I find two really good wrestlers, then guess what? They just filled the spot on my card. Yeah. So that's kind of, it, it's a good thing. Yeah. And you, you mentioned there was two seminars. The first is from 6.30 to 8.30 for those with 0 to 20 professional wrestling matches. And afterwards, from 8.30 to 10.30 for the second seminar with people who have had more than 20. Um, 
thanks again for joining us today, Tommy. Um, is there anything else you'd like to plug? Nope. Just uh, go to houseofhardcore.net. My social media is the Tommy Dreamer. And uh, that's it, man. Thank you very much.